The third and final product we're going to look at that Pertec put inside this dual drive cabinet is the FD3812 that you see here in this picture. This is basically a double density version of the FD3712 and for the most part the cabinet etc is all exactly the same. The only difference is a couple of new indicators, one for double density, one for right protect, and the power switch is moved to the upper right corner to make room for where the controller board goes in this cabinet. Now, I'm restoring one of these for another hobbyist, but I had him keep the cabinet to save on shipping costs. So that's why we're looking at this picture here. For the rest of the video, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the real equipment that's inside this cabinet. What you're looking at here, in addition to the Altair computer over on the left, are the major internal components of the FD3812 drive cabinet. 3812 came along about a year after the 3712, and it's essentially a double density version of the 3712 drive. Uh, if you looked at them assembled, they almost look identical. Uh, they both have the same cabinet, they both have the same chassis, the same power supply, uh, same disk drive mechanisms. They both use a ribbon cable over to a parallel interface board in the computer. Uh, the command set is basically the same. Um, the only difference is that the 3812 added a new command byte to support the new features. So in that new command byte is a uh, bit that says whether I.O. is double or single density. There's also a bit in there that says whether it's accessing the top or bottom of the disk. And there's also a bit in there that says whether you are writing a track for the purpose of formatting or just regular I.O. So that's one significant new feature in the 3812 is that it could format a disc, whereas the 3712 couldn't. You had to buy pre-formatted media for that. You also notice that I mentioned it could choose top or bottom of a disc. So the controller supported double-sided operation as well as double density. However, Pertec had no double-sided drives, so the 3812 was still single-sided, uh, but it did double the capacity because it was double density. Now, interestingly on the controller, uh, since it did support double-sided, they went ahead and made it where they could sell this controller to other companies or people that might want it um, by putting on a standard interface to the drive. What they did is switch from using their own internal proprietary Pertec interfaces and put on the Shugart interface standard as far as the pinout. So now any drive that used the Shugart standard could be hooked to this controller. So that's double-sided drives, for example, from Shugart or Qum. Um, and other manufacturers. So they were hoping maybe to get some other sales out of that. All right, so take a quick look here. We see uh, that's the power supply. That's the same on both of them. Power supply in the back is not part of the system. It's just, I'm just using it to get some AC connectors that were part of the cabinet I don't have out. Uh, the drive is the same as in the 3712, except the logic board is slightly different. This logic board provides a Shugart style interface on the rear connector instead of the Pertec pinouts. So that was the only change there. Uh, I have up here on top the uh, interface board that goes in the computer. I have one in the computer. This one's a separate one. Um, this was changed for the 3812. They made a new version of this that was used for the 3812 and the 3712. Uh, the thing they had to change was they had to automate some of the handshaking. So the problem was when you went to double density, the transfer rate was too high to do all the handshaking and software like it was done with the 3712. So they added a one shot to automatically clock in each data byte and each command byte. So that's, this board was changed to support the 3812. However, with just a jumper change or two, it can also support the 3712. So the version you see here was used for both of those. All right, um, we're gonna go ahead and fire this up and take a look at it, but first let's take a look at this controller board. As you can see, there's only one controller board instead of two, like we saw on the 3712. Uh, there are a lot of ICs on this. There's a hundred of them on here, but that's still a lot less than there was on the 3712. It had over 150 on the two boards. This again is about only a hundred or so. So one question might be with all the additional features this had to do, including formatting disks and supporting double density, how they do it with fewer chips? Well, the way they did it was by using PROMs to implement a number of um, the state machine functions. So it's, it's sort of like a, um, a microcode, the microcode in a CPU that would have been implemented in TTL back in the days. So there's seven TTL PROMs on this. It's still TTL. It's the little uh, chips you see in sockets. Um, and those PROMs were a state machine that uh, could actually take 
essentially branches and do logic and that kind of thing. Uh, no CPU, but yeah, it is sort of like microcode uh, using these prompts. I got to do some work debugging the format circuit on this to get it working, so I had a good chance to really dig into all that, and it's a very interesting design. Uh, very clean, very professional board, no blue wires or anything. All right, um, so as well as that board was laid out, uh, laid out and as well as it worked, and then of course they saw the chance of other companies maybe wanting to use it. The problem was this came out in early 78, and by then the Western Digital 1771, like we mentioned in the previous video, had been out for single density for a year and a half, and the 1793 for double density was now out as well. In fact, here's a, um, here's a board made for the Southwest Technical 6800 computer that does everything that that giant board with 100 components does on it. This uses the, uh, and this is also, also the only board that goes in the computer. You don't need the separate board that goes in the computer either. So with the introduction of the Western Digital chips, that of course was a major game changer, uh, made design of a um, disc controller, soft sector disc controller, even double density, double sided, much simpler. So this was basically dead as it came to the market. But some of them were sold, obviously we have one here, so let's fire it up and take a look at it. We'll go ahead and put CPM in here. All right, then turn on the computer and examine F1000. F1000 is the prom that's on the interface board. You can see it in the bottom right over there, but it's in this one right here. And hit run. Hear the drive take off and you see the lights flashing. And we can come over here to the monitor. And we can see that we're up in ICOM 3812 double density uh, CPM. Here's what's on drive A. And we can see on drive B. Let's do a stat and see the capacity of the disk. And here's the key difference. You see we have 486 kilobytes per drive now, whereas before with a single density, we were exactly half of that, 243. And if you use this controller with a double-sided drive, um, I've actually done that, and then you have twice that capacity again. So almost a megabyte per drive uh, with this controller. But again, uh, based on its timing, you really never saw large discrete TTL controllers like this again, because uh, Western Digital and their 40-pin ICs pretty much took over the controller world. Hard sector controllers started disappearing as well because it became easy to make a soft sector controller. And those were more universally um, interchangeable between machines and media. All right, well, that does it for this video. And that does it for this sequence of three videos about the three uh, Pertec, MITs, and ICOM drives that were in those large double-wide cabinets. Um, this one is out of the cabinet so you can see the insides, but uh, that was pretty much the end of the personal computer era for Pertec. Uh, it didn't pan out too well for them, and they, they stuck with making drives and things like that going forward.